country, Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. Somebody touch me, somebody touch me, somebody touch my soul. Thank you very much. Calvary, famous name. Arima, famous name. Thank you very much, Laurel. Permit me tonight to acknowledge and to share with me cabinet colleague, member of parliament, Somebody touch me, somebody touch me, somebody touch my soul. You hearing me now? Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are in Calvary, Narima, and I'm very pleased to be here, and I was just about to acknowledge my cabinet colleagues, the Member of Parliament, Farouk Maloney, Minister of Housing, Member of Parliament for Arima, Minister of Planning and Development. <laughs> Member of Parliament for La Talparo, Minister of Youth Development. And of course, your very own Senator. And of course, I once again would like to welcome to our PNM meeting, as we always do, the Venerable Deputy Political Leader, our matriarch, Mr. John Newell Williams. My other cabinet colleagues, my party officers, and particularly, I would like to acknowledge and welcome my colleagues from Tobago who are here with us tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly members of the media who are here with us tonight, I want to recommit and to identify one of the funding pillars of the PNM when this party was formed in 1956. And that was the principle of morality in public affairs. <laughs> and just to let the population know that after all these years, the PNM still holds fast to the principle of morality in public affairs. From time to time, there may be human failings. But when that occurs, we hold on to the principle of morality in public affairs. And that is why I just want to point out to the population of Trinidad and Tobago tonight that the opposition leader is desperate and angry. And she's on a mission to try to prove to the country that all of us are the same. We are not. The PNM subscribes to, aspires to, and holds fast to the principle of morality in public affairs. <laughs> 
Incidentally, today, May 24th, the day in 2010, this country changed its government. And the person who is now the opposition leader was welcomed into office, welcomed into office as the first female prime minister and the new prime minister of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, not of the UNC. However, today the opposition leader is desperate and angry because having got themselves voted out of office summarily in 2015 and accused of some of the most heinous actions, the opposition leader is fearful that the slow turning wheel of justice could stop and call their names. That's what she's panicking about. That is what the opposition leader is panicking about. So they engage in no discussion of policies or programs or reality for the country. Just personal attacks on members of the government for the singular purpose to be able to say that we are all the same. So that when they hit a rock in their leaky ship, the spotlight that will focus on them, they will say all the way the same. We are not. The opposition leader knows that a significant number of her members and associates have not the allegations, though, have serious difficulty with the law in Trinidad and Tobago. You have one attorney general before the court, Jan Bale, he's our, he is the advisor while Jan Bale, another one close also on bail, police seriously talking to a number of them. So what they're trying to do is to give the impression, well, since they could not live out the fact that, you remember the story, nothing happening, nothing happening. Two weeks ago, I think it was a high price lawyer, a specialist investigator who was sworn in as a SRP in the police service in Trinidad and Tobago to pursue white collar crime, came to Trinidad and Tobago to continue her work with the police. And there was panic in the UNC camp. They'd gone on platform shouting the woman's name and accusing the government of spending money as if you could catch teeth without money. <laughs> Absolute panic. And we just said to them, the government of Trinidad and Tobago is committed to eradicating white collar criminal conduct in the corridors of power in Trinidad and Tobago and will follow the evidence wherever it takes us. <laughs> but I don't normally listen to the UNC diatribe on Sundays and Mondays. I just happen to be passing this morning in front of the radio and heard a rebroadcast and it was the opposition leader saying about and her words were so many allegations against Faris and it dawned on me that that was the major item of political activity for the last five or six years. Let me explain to the people of Trinidad and Tobago what is the foundation of that. The law in this country, the Integrity in Public Life Act spells it out in detail. And if you are in a position anywhere, not, even, not only the cabinet, but anywhere in public business, and any private business of yours or your close family or associates have business in front of that entity, you are required to declare your interests. And if you have such an interest, 
you then recuse yourself from the decision making that is taking place in your favor or your family favor, your wife or your children or your whatever it is. That is the law for all of us. So in the cabinet, every few weeks, the Minister of Finance invites the banks of the country to interact with the Ministry of Finance to provide funding in one way or the other. Borrow, pay, borrow, pay, but you have to go through a, a bidding process. And the banks make their offer, and the Ministry of Finance determine which offer they accept based on the price and so on and so on. That goes on every month in the Ministry of Finance. And that has to come to the cabinet at the end of the process for the cabinet approval. The Ministry of Finance can't just go off and borrow money just so. The cabinet has to approve it. When that comes to the cabinet, in the cabinet is a member, Stuart Young, whose brother works for a bank. He doesn't own the bank, but he works there. And every time that bank's name is called in one of these transactions at the Ministry of Finance, Stuart Young recuses himself from the decision. So if the Ministry of Finance went 10 times for the year, and that bank was involved eight times, you will see on the eighth occasion, Stuart Young would have recused himself. I have a stamp. I stamp it on the, on, on the cabinet note, and I indicate which minister. That's what the law asks for. Faris, on the other hand, is married into a family that has a lot of property in Port of Spain. And for years, those properties, many of them are rented by the government for all kinds of things and so on. Anytime any of those rentals come up for consideration, whether it's renewal or to establish a lease, because he is in that family, he recuses himself. And in his own case, as a property owner himself, if his property comes up, it does the same thing. That's what the law asks you to do. But the UNC somehow managed and is managing to get the population to believe that complying in the, with the law is somehow an indication of wrongdoing on the part of these two gentlemen. And they run a whole election campaign on recusal. They know the exact number. My daughters got scholarships. The list of scholarships come to the cabinet. I'm in the cabinet. I had to say to the cabinet, these are my daughters on different occasions, one than the other one. So you, 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 you indicate that you have an interest there. Later on, Nian um, Gatsby Lolly comes into the cabinet. Her daughter is on a scholarship list. She indicates that she has a, a conflict there. So others in the cabinet will know, and therefore you can't influence it in your favor. That's what the law calls for. But they're on platform talking about allegations against Farish because he, have, he recused himself. It is if he didn't recuse himself, then he would have been in breach of the law and then he would have had a problem. So it was Farish, then it was Stuart, now it's Foster. So as I'm passing in front of the radio, she went straight from Farish to Foster. Foster must go. Foster must go. And the Prime Minister is accused of doing nothing. These are her words. The Prime Minister sidesteps the issues of firing these three people. The first issue was money deposited in an account. Money deposited into an account of a credit union. Okay, that's a fact. And of course, if money is deposited and the government watching agency sees money is deposited and want to know what is the meaning of this, they go and ask questions about it. That's the law. And since they raise it on platform with allegations of fact and calling for resignation, I asked the minister, what is this about? Bring me the evidence of your involvement here. And he does so, and he brings it to me, and I look at it, and I realize once again, 
Pamela Passat Bissessa is making a horse's rend of herself. <laughs> Nothing for me to do. Then that didn't stick. Two years later, or he, it's again another one. He has three pieces of HTC land that he has grabbed. He said, let me, what is this about? Let me see. Comes. Fact. Bought one from HDC, bought two from people who own HDC houses that, that belong to them. One plus two is three. He must, he must go. He must go because Kamala says so. Because she says so. But I simply want to tell you all the hypocrisy drips like green bile, you know. That is the same leader who was leader of the UNC when the chairman of the Mayaro Corporation was charged, arrested, and charged for bribery. What did she do? Charged. Not allegation, you know. Whole night last night, if this is that, and if this is that, and if this is that, if you were an honest woman, you wouldn't be talking about you. If, 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 if. Well, if you don't know, then that's, just come down and shut up. Everything is if you have, you have scandalized the man's name, you have misled the country, and still talking about if, if means you don't know that it is so, and then demanding that I act based on your if, and accusing me of sidestepping, and what is worse? In Tobago, we call it concursa. She is the big defender of Marlene accusing me of um, abandoning Marlene after all that Marlene do for me and all, all, all the hard work Marlene did in the parliament. Mr. Kavna Pasad Bissasa, stay the hell out of PNM business. <laughs> Marlene McDonald, my colleague, has been arrested and charged for a criminal matter. What is Kamala Prasad Bissessa saying? That that was my doing? An officer, a member of my party, is charged for a criminal matter, and she's accusing me of abandoning Mali, the only person who I allow, apparently I was supposed to go and take away Mali from the police. Our support for Marlene is that she's innocent until proven guilty and she will get her day in court. What does that, how, how that become a UNC matter? How? But let me tell you something. Eh? You all remember, you know, I was in the parliament a couple of days ago, a couple of sessions ago, and I heard Rudy Indar sing say that the, the NIPCO, the state company, had lost the arbitration and that the government has to pay millions of dollars now to the contractor. Because they're always on the contractor side. Eh? The other day, a contractor sued a state enterprise for $1.2 billion dollars payment certificates that they were claiming that they were owed and claiming 1.2 billion the matter went to court and the judge ruled that the contractor is owed 471 million dollars that 600 million of the 1.2 was not owed you know the UNC don't see that taxpayers save themselves 600 million dollars and the judge ruled that this money the contractor and elements of the company were seeking to take that money from taxpayers dishonestly through a conspiracy. The judge ruled that, you know, the judge ruled that the extra $600 million or $700 million was an attempt to get it through fraud. But the UNC's argument is the contractor win the case and the government had to pay $473 million. Well, I can tell them all tonight. That state company fought that matter and saved taxpayers $700 million. I've been telling you all for years that the UNC did something 
which I don't think any other government has done. After they awarded the contract to Point Fortin and gave all of it to one contractor from Brazil, the contractor got into difficulty in Brazil, went bankrupt, and secondly, stopped the work in Trinidad. When we came into office, we met a series of people, contractors and others, who were owed money by the contractor who had stopped the job as a result of the bankruptcy in Brazil and whatever was going on. I told you then that when they awarded the contract, the contract documents had clauses in it that protected against that kind of eventuality. There was one clause was clause 15.2e in the contract, which said that if the contractor is insolvent or goes bankrupt, the bonds that the contractor put up to bond the contract is callable by the state. In other words, the state can protect itself and recover the money because the contractor has gone bankrupt on, his, on the state's job. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you, they did something which allowed the contractor to go away with the bonds. And we came into government and met that, hot and warm. We went to court and argued with the court that this behavior of our government was not a reasonable action and what we are dealing with here is an attempt to defraud the state of a substantial amount of money. The court agreed and agreed in our favor that we should get the bonds and cash them and use the money on the project. That is how the Point 14 Highway is being built going on there. But I also told you that the contractor is not lying over and play dead the contractor is going to go to arbitration. And we will only know our fate when the arbitration decision comes in. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the chickens have come home to roost. On the 31st of March, and I want you to pay attention to the dates, Confirmed by the arbitrator in the arbitration on the 31st of March 2015, OS was insolvent under the laws of Trinidad and Tobago and Brazil. Who was in government in this country on the 31st of March 2015? And the election was in September 2015. So here it is. The contractor, by public information, because all of us knew OAS went bankrupt for corruption in Brazil. March, the contractor goes bankrupt. March, so April, May, June, July, August, the UNC under Kamala Sushila, is it? Did absolutely nothing to protect the public money. But there's a clause in there that says, if the contractor is bankrupt, that money belongs to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. They were not only content to do nothing. Let me read for you what the arbitrator has now said. Notwithstanding these matters, NITCO was not at the date of his note for termination entitled to terminate the contract under Clause 15.2. Remember I told you Clause 15.2 was where we were protected? The arbitrator is saying NITCO cannot defend itself under Clause 15.2 because it had waived such right by reason of the terms of the addendum to the contract 
which was entered into by the parties on the 4th of September, 2015. I ask you all to pay attention to the date. The 4th of September, 2015 was the last working day that Kamala Prasad Bissessa and the UNC were in the office as government of Trinidad and Tobago. That was a Friday. September 4, 2015 was a Friday. Saturday was the 5th. Sunday was the 6th. The election was on the 7th, the Monday, and they lost the election. But on the 4th of September, the UNC removed the clause by an addendum in that contract and allowed the contractor to go away with almost a billion dollars. Today, because of that situation, the court gave us the money. The arbitrator has taken it back. And we now owe the contractor 852 million US dollars. Sorry, TT dollars, TT. Sorry, 127 million US, which is 852 million TT dollars. That is the money that has now come round that circle. And that only could have occurred because the protection for the people's money was removed on the last day of the UNC being in office. They always want to know. They always have concerns. Tonight, I want you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, to ask Mrs. Kamala Prasad Bissessa and her cohort of that thing they call the People's Partnership, who removed this clause? We know why. We know why. But we don't know who. Calling on me to give you names of pedophiles. If ever there was ever a case to be made against an individual for misbehavior in public office. It is the person, it is the person who authorized the removal of that clause, which is now costing this country $852 million. So tonight, I call on the Commissioner of Police. I call on the Commissioner of Police tonight to go into NIDCO and find out by what authority and under whose authority that clause was removed. I have been raising this matter for years, and nobody in the UNC will ever respond whenever I raise it. Well, the matter has now come to this. They're calling people to come out and march because public servants can't get this and they can't get that. And everything in the country, every day, they have some complaint about something. What can we do with $852 million? What can $852 million do for you anywhere in this country? But in the meantime, somebody in the UNC administration had the authority to, add, to put that addendum on that contract on the last day that they were in office. You know why? By that time, they realized that they had lost the election. They didn't do anything in March, April, May, June, because they expect to come back after the election and just continue allowing the bankrupt contractor to hold on to the money. But when they realize that it is possible for the government to change and there'll be a different government in office, they did that to allow the contractor to go away with $852,969,825. And then when that ruling comes in, because I was warning you, I said, until the arbitration is completed, we don't know what our position is. We got the permission to use the money for the last four years on the highway, but it was always clear that they will go to arbitration on the grounds that the clause was removed. 
Well, the arbitration, the arbitration has confirmed that now. We owe this money now. Unless, of course, we can successfully appeal it. But in the meantime, who is it who did that? Who did that? And why has Mrs. Kamala Prasad Bissessa and Sul Rambachan never respond to this? Why? Who another one called Jack Warner? Every week he publishes something in the papers. I asked for years in this country, what was the nature of the business that was conducted in South Africa between a minister of government of the UNC and the Brazilians who flew by private plane from Brazil to South Africa in a hotel in South Africa a few days before this contract was awarded? And all they do, they just don't answer. They just don't answer. Just turn up, mock every day, and showing it at the window. Every day is some mock, straight up and show it at the window. Attack people. But let me tell you something. We are resilient people. I lead you, and I know that you are resilient. They don't change their behavior, you know. You see all this nonsense that the minister was dealing with just now about pedophile and whatever? That's, what they have, that's where they have taken us. Look at what our national conversation is. Look at what it is. The leader of the opposition on platform and rebroadcasting it as though she do God's service, coming to talk that rubbish to the children of this country. But I'm not surprised. I told her I ignore her. I, last, in the 2015 election, she got Ian Allen to go and get a woman and a girl and a woman daughter. They made a video with the mother with her back facing the camera. So nobody saw the woman's face. And she was telling a story about me that I interfered with her daughter when she was a junior teen and the girl father beat me up. <laughs> and it was done in the presence of witnesses. And the witnesses were Maurice Marshall, who dead, and Ken Valley, who dead. That is the modus operandi. And she's on an audio telling Ian Allen when to publish it. She wanted it published on Thursday night, election Thursday night. You had to publish it on Thursday night. That is the woman who is today pretending that she has some concerns about morality in public affairs and therefore she wants Foster to go and Faris this and Stuart Young that. She makes me want to puke. I want the commissioner of police to go into NIDCO and the minister responsible for NIDCO is the minister of works and transport. He is hereby instructed to instruct NIDCO to cooperate with the police officers so the country So the country can determine under whose hand and under whose direction this travesty took place. You could imagine what we could do with $852 million that belong to us, that they gave away for love and affection, for love and affection of the contractor. I'm coming now to tell me that the one called Wade Mark, every Tuesday, he has some nonsense to try to bust some mark. The biggest mark in this country is just sit down alone exam. You alone get a special exam. You were scoring at 25%. You have your special exam done to you, and you end up with 90%. Tarnish the university forever and ever, amen. You know, you know, they really think we forget them, you know. These people really think we forget them, you know. But this is serious business. $852 million. So, ladies and gentlemen, that being so, you heard Foster talk about the program that we have going on for young people. Just remember, 
all those items that he's mentioned there and all the young people who are going to be involved and benefiting there, that's additional expenditure on the budget. These are new programs and these are additional people. And therefore, wherever we commit to those programs, whether it's building the structure, outfitting it, training, wherever it is, and it's not cheap, they have to find additional money to do that for these people. So the hundreds of young people who will pass through these programs, let it not be said that nothing is being done for them. This is what is being done for them, and it costs millions of dollars. But they intend to put a spoke in every wheel that this government turned, whether it's in foreign affairs, whether it is in the Ministry of Finance, whether it is calling on the Americans to sanction the Prime Minister and, 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 and whoever else, they put a spoke in every wheel. So this program, this youth program that you so enthusiastically embrace tonight, they get a lawyer to write the minister. So as you know how to go and pay a lawyer to respond there, eh? because a lawyer is not chief. Let me just quote for you one line in the lawyer letter coming from the UNC. And the, the, the letter is complaining about, on behalf of people who illegally take hold of state land. You know the attack on Foster is about land grabbing? Well, this lawyer is writing the minister, Foster, on behalf of land grabbers. <laughs> and hear them. In these circumstances, these displaced farmers, nobody can displace you off your own land. The fact that you are being displaced is because you quite properly or improperly go and take up position on LSA land as if it was your own and prepare to fight for it. Right? Because that same Kamala Prasad business is on record telling them, go and squat wherever you want and we will find you. You all remember that? So these displaced farmers have to wonder why the LSA is evicting them. Well, nobody could evict you from your own land. But allowed, and listen to this, to assign lands to strangers to the agricultural sector. Tonight, I want to say to whoever write this letter, that the people of Diego Martin, Karanaj, Aruka, Tunapuna, anywhere in this country, they are no strangers to any land in this country. And if they don't understand the history of this country, it is the ancestors of slaves who cut the forest and created the clearance in this country. There are people in this country who belong to that group of people whose ancestors met forests in St. In, in Joseph and cleared it all the way to create the fields in this country until sugar became a crop that died in 2004, I think it was, in this country. So who are you to say that if the government has a program to encourage young people into agriculture and some of them come from the East-West Corridor, that they are strangers and should be denied access to the land. No way! One of the problems we have in this country is that while we had generations of people who lived off the land, as the standard of living improved in the country, many people, younger people, young generation, moved into new jobs, and the older people, as they die off, we have fewer and fewer farmers. And the skills that are required to farm, whether it is in crop or in livestock, those skills are lost. And we could talk till the cow come home, unless we increase the number of farmers and get the new generation onto the land to farm, we will not impact on our food import bill. So here it is that we made land available all around the country, go around the country and see who is on land all around the country farming. I distinctly recall that I was Minister of Agriculture when there was an IDB program, Agricultural Access Roads, 
And when I looked at the program, I was in the opposition then, when the program was looked at, and the position was that there is to be no expenditure in Paramin, because Paramin doesn't have any agriculture, and it's not an agricultural area. I had to fight that, and they would not resist, they, they would not give up. When they gave up is when we came into government. I, along with the MP for Diego Martin East at the time, we went to Paramin and got the program taken to Paramin. And that is why today there's a concrete road from Lower Paramin all the way across the Shodo. And Paramin has some of the more dedicated farmers in Trinidad and Tobago. That road from Cameron to Shodo Hill, we built that road against the resistance from, of the UNC. Because as far as they're concerned, farmers are only those people who vote for them in the, the, the constituency where they live. We say all the people of Trinidad and Tobago ought to have access to all the resources. And if there are people in the East West Corridor or in Talparo or in Karen or wherever, as all we want of you is a genuine interest in agriculture, animal husbandry or, or corporate production, and we will help you to do it. They come to tell me about our citizens are strangers. I say no more on that. But if they want that debate, I'm ready for it. With respect to the matters that Mr. Robinson just raised here tonight, I'm happy to hear and see that the opposition leader for the first time is going to file a vote of no confidence in me in my capacity as prime minister. I have the distinction of running this country for almost seven years and the leader of the opposition has never seen it fit to file a vote of no confidence in me or my government. But now she will. Now she will. Because I am supposed to have lied to the parliament. So you didn't find no word of no confidence about any energy or planning and development or Tobago. No, no, no. You are only moved now on a matter of truth. Because I said that I have never seen and I don't know anything about a report by some Dr. Sabga. I would not be so crazy or so stupid to say that the UNC didn't pass five pieces of legislation in the parliament. Everything that goes on in parliament, if you sneeze sometimes, they put in brackets sneeze or stoops. That's what Hansard is. Hansard records everything that goes on in parliament. So how could I put God out my thoughts to say the UNC didn't pass some legislation? But that is their attempt to twist it by saying, well, you say we didn't do anything and we passed some legislation. Well, those children who are being brutalized at nights in their bed, tell them about the legislation that they passed. Tell them about that. Tell them about the police you didn't send to take the bully off the back. Because passing those legislation that couldn't be operationalized did absolutely nothing for those children in those homes who were being terrorized at night. But you see, when people find themselves in that situation, they're usually not alone. You see this? This came out on the 15th of May, which is a few days ago. It is a report of an independent investigation of the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee. Those of you who have computer and access to, um, you can get it on your computer. Go and read this report. It's a report which is identical to our report here, where children in the Southern Baptist community in the hands of the Southern Baptist leadership were sexually abused. And for 20 years, 
the Southern Baptist Committee hid this report. As a matter of fact, there was one gentleman, a fellow called Russell Moore. He was forever demanding that this report see the light of day and that action be taken and justice be brought for those children. They did all manner of evil to him. Accused him of all kinds of things. But eventually, today, this has come out. Go, when you go, and, go and look at what's going on at the Southern Baptist Convention now. Retribution now. And wringing of hands because they buried it for 20 years. This was buried in Trinidad and Tobago. Identical business for 24 years. You know why I got this? I was in Guyana last week. Before I went to Guyana, I called out the police to find this report and take action if there's any evidence in there to take action against anybody. When I came back from Guyana, somebody I don't know who dropped this off at my residence. This is the first time that I am seeing this report. The first time when I saw this report was last Sunday evening when I got back from Guyana. I am looking through it for the first time. I haven't yet finished reading it. But then when the leader of the opposition, who was a prime minister for five years during the existence of this report, is going to file a vote of no confidence in me, because I say I have not seen this report, and the parliament has confirmed that this report was never laid in the parliament. And they saw bold face, even as the parliament has told the press and the press has reported that the report was never laid in Parliament, they are still saying so for the benefit of public misinformation, they're still talking about we late and what we do and what we do. I expect that the police will go through this document. And if there are allegations in here supported by fact and the perpetrators are still alive, well, they are still available for criminal prosecution. <laughs> still available for criminal prosecution. But senior counsel, self-appointed, when the when they, when they express broke the story, dismissed it. That was 25 years ago. We're all going with that now. That was senior counsel. And I want to tell Mr. Spassad this other night. Don't waste your time on me. It is the express that exposed this matter. It is the express that got the facts and informed the people. It is a member of your cabinet, Vona St. Rose, who accused you all of cowardice and burying the report. That's why I first heard about it in that way. I heard Vona St. Rose talking on 995.5 about this situation. But she leaves Vona St. Rose to take on. She leaves the Express to take on and coming to pretend that she's coming to fight me with motion of no confidence in the parliament. Come on, look, look at yourself. Eh? <laughs> but that is how they are. Try to mislead the public every time about everything. It doesn't matter how heinous the lies. They tell it to you. And when truth comes, they double down on the lie. And now they want to lead public servants to a place of milk and honey. After you give away $852 million, you calling on unions to mobilize their membership to come and march. As if that somehow will give the Minister of Finance more resources. And there's a union leader saying what they're asking for is to be able to pay for the standard of living the way it used to be. But I'm not surprised that is the leadership talk, right? You don't have the business, the, 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 the work to do, and so does the government. Now, I took a little time to do some of the estimations because I don't want the population to be misled. I. I see some people in one of the newspapers making statements of facts encouraged by some of their leaders. 
that we, the political directorate and the parliamentarians, we look after ourselves and take pay increase and don't want to give public servants a pay increase. For the benefit of the media, who speaks to the public, let me tell you all what the facts are. The last time MPs, and that includes ministers, got a pay increase was March 2014 from the November 2013 recommendation of the 98th report of the Salaries Review Commission. That's the last time anybody around the parliament or around the cabinet got any pay increase. And pay increases for members of parliament are not three years, things where every three years they get something. It's open-ended. There's no limit. It could go for 10 or 15 years. So far it has gone. This year it would be the, what, the eighth year? This year would be the eighth year that that pay increase that we got then is still in force. And I could tell you, there's no report before the parliament now being considered for any increase for members of parliament. And I must also remind you that when I became prime minister of this country, at dealing with the economic calamity and the revenue losses that we faced, I made a public commitment to the country that there will be no pay increase for members of parliament until the economy has been turned around. And just about when we were coming to a, to a position where we were within sight of balancing the budget and the economy was beginning to pick up, in comes COVID, two years of beating. And what I said then stands now. There will be no pay increase for members of the executive of the cabinet or the members of parliament until the economy can deal with it. And that was the early position as regard members of parliament. So anybody you see talking about who took pay increase and who got pay increase, that is just foolishness and nonsense. And the very sad thing that I'm saying now to the unions in Trinidad and Tobago, I said up front to my colleagues in the cabinet and to my colleagues in the parliament. I'm consistent on this matter. So circumstances beyond our control gave us some good, some good news. The Minister of Finance reported that because of the unusually high oil price and some improvement in the gas price, we are going to get a bit more money than we had budgeted for. And we immediately indicated that some of that money will go to public servants. We don't hide anything from this country, you know. We immediately said some of that money will go to public servants. So ladies and gentlemen, how much is it? Because you have to ask yourself, how much is it that we have that we now want to share with public servants? It might be approximately $4 billion. That is the increase outside of what we had budgeted for. You would have seen, we went to Parliament last week and added to the budget $3.1 billion to be paid for from the $4 billion. We were, in, we were only able to do that because we got the $4 billion and all the things we said we were going to do Nobody in the parliament got up and said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. That 3.1 billion covered expenses that the government was carrying. And had we not got that increase, that unusual increase because of the Ukraine war, if we wanted to do those very sad things, we would have had to go and borrow another 3.1 billion. And since the budget had already got a deficit of 9.1 billion in it, if we had gone and borrowed that 3 billion that we appropriated last week, the budget for 2022 would have had a deficit of 12 billion dollars. 12,000 million dollars. Those are the realities of our circumstance. 
So while we say that we have got some improvement in our circumstances, when somebody comes up and asks for X percent, you have to determine now, is that affordable? Because we all know that what's happening in Ukraine could be temporary. More than likely, it is going to be temporary. Because the war in Ukraine has pushed out of the market the largest exporter of oil and probably the largest exporter of gas, one of the largest exporters of gas. It is the Ukraine war that pushed the Russian supply out of the market. If anything happens out there that caused that situation to change, then that pressure for the high price is gone and oil price will fall. That's simple logic. If tomorrow the Russians decide to stop the war, the pressure on the pushing up of the oil price will be relieved. If tomorrow the Saudis decide, well, okay, we've made enough money out of this special arrangement, we're going to pump more oil. If tomorrow the Venezuelans come back into the market, that goes. So we are in a very temporary situation driven solely because the Russian supplies have been pushed out of the market as a penalty for the Russian behavior at Ukraine. We have no control over that. So if we go and cut our cloth to suit these prices that exist today, when the turnaround comes, we may find ourselves with parts of our bodies exposed because the cloth was not properly cut. We have to give the public servants a reasonable offer because we don't need anybody to tell us the pressure that the people in this country like public servants and others have been under. It is we who said that we will not go to the IMF. We will stay here in this country and prescribe our own medicine, giving us the opportunity. giving us the opportunity to do what no IMF program will allow us to do. We have not laid off a single public servant who is gazetted as a public servant in this country. Because, because we have said, first objective, keep your job. Second objective, at the end of the month, have the money to pay you. And third objective, as soon as we are able to, will improve your earning capacity. <laughs> that is the order in which the government has seen and has operated. If we find ourselves in a situation where we put number three in front of number one, then you know what happened there. Understood? We are saying the most important thing is to keep all the jobs in place. I know what it is like to be told by the Minister of Finance that at the end of the month, we don't have enough money to pay public servants. I know that because we dealt with that. We can't put that in place as a permanent arrangement. I also know in the CARICOM, when I was working around the CARICOM, there was one particular CARICOM territory Public servants are working for three, four months before they get any pay because there just wasn't enough money available to pay them. And there's one prime minister who tells me every morning he asks the accounts department how much money they collected yesterday to determine what they can spend today. You don't want to be in that situation. We've got a little breathing space now. I said, let us not overreact. Let us not get carried away. I see somebody in the editorial saying, that is not enough. I didn't say that was enough. That was my opener. You know, and the unions know, in negotiations, a position comes forward, and one is there. There's a high and there's a low. And the purpose of the negotiation is to come to somewhere in between where both sides can agree or that the negotiations can go no further. That's what it is. 
So look, let's, let's look at some numbers, people. For, let's say, the Minister of Finance offered through the CPO one plus one. There are two periods, right? One plus one. Let's, let's, let's tonight here, just double that and go two plus two. Okay? That's four percent. That will cost a back pay of $1.45 billion if that's all that we do. And of course, an additional $730 million a year going forward. Because once you, once you change the pay, there's a permanent increase going forward. There's the back pay as one pay for the older period and for the new period going forward. Question is, is that sustainable? Having spent three billion of the four billion already, the war is grinding to a halt, or it will jog out for a little while longer, we don't know. Of the 4.2 billion, we spent 3.1 already. Let's say we have one left. The back pay at 4% would be 1.45 billion. You know what that means? We'll have to go and borrow $450 million to pay that back pay. The government may or may not do that. Let it work itself out. Let it work itself out. One thing I can give you, the assurance, people of Trinidad and Tobago, wherever you are, is that you have a government in office that is cognizant of your circumstances and is a responsible government and will give you the best relief that your country can afford. <laughs> and let's get generous. Let's say we've got 8%. 4 plus 4. Sounds good? We might get a settlement on that. That will cost in back pay $3.6 billion. And an, annual, an additional annual cost of $1.4 billion. Do you see that money in the Treasury in Trinidad and Tobago at this time? Do you see the Minister of Finance in Trinidad and Tobago being able to find that money on a monthly basis to make sure that you with jobs get paid at the end of the month. But it might happen. Because when we came into government, when we came into government, after the others gave away the 800 and something million dollars, and the oil price was rocketing downwards to the bottom, we met a 14% back pay that cost us six billion dollars and we paid it we borrowed the money and paid it i want to ask a question are you the people of trinidad and tobago telling the government to do the same thing again tell me i'm listening tell me we could give an increase like that but you must know that if we do that, we're going to have to go and borrow the money. And if we do that on this scale, in this way, and the oil price, gas price change, we are leaping in the dark. I see somebody saying how my statement to the unions is because I freed the march and um, workers are going to come out. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no such fear. What I have is confidence in the good sense of the good people of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, we have just passed the local government bill in the parliament. It was passed only with the votes of the PNM because the other people who had votes in the parliament refused to use their votes to bring about an attempt to modernize local government in this country. The other day I was hearing 
I see Kong Flow run then here from Toko Sanjay. The other issue of the other day, big bacchanal on the news, main item on the news, Toko Sanjay and the corporation can't cut the grass on the plain field so that the young people in Toko can't use the plain field because the grass is so high because there was no money to cut the grass. You also that news? And there's no money to fix a pothole here. If there's a flood in one of the corporations requiring a, a $500,000 to bring relief to people, the corporation has no money to do it. The corporation never has any money to do anything. Brings me to Gerard Fernie Smith. I went into parliament in 1986, January, and I served with some distinguished parliamentarians. One of them was Gerald Fernie Smith. And his position was that local government was a waste of time and was useless. And over time, if one is not careful, one can come to that conclusion. Because everything you want done in your district, in your street, in your neighborhood, you cannot call the corporation and say, please, this is my pri priority. Can you have it done? Because you get a guaranteed answer. We don't have any money here to do that. And I'm saying this government intends to change that. <laughs> local government reform is meant to put better management structure in place in local government. It is meant to ask all the burgesses to pay a small amount per household and that small amount paid by many, many people will put a cash flow in the hands of the corporation wherever they are and that money will always be available on call on your account to do small things in your neighborhood. The quality of your life will change immediately. There are those who think that property tax is a make or break in this country's politics. This country has a party that went to a campaign in an election and told the country that you elect us to office, we will put property tax in place and we are going to use that money to improve local government, to improve the quality of your life, to improve this country, and we have a mandate. And we are taking steps to ensure that the property tax is collected and the word I want to use is hypothecate. I have a neighbor who loves that word. Hypothecate means that the revenue comes in and is designated for a particular purpose. So that hypothecation will take place, that, that money collected that you will pay. And you know who pays property tax? People who own property. I see one set of people who don't own a matchbox <laughs> objecting to property tax. Property tax is paid by people who own property, and because they own property, the tax is used to preserve the value of their property. If your street is not clean, if the grass is not cut, if there's no police service, if there's no fire service, if there's no health service, if there's no rat control, if there's no mosquito control, how much is your property worth? And the same people who are leading this charge, many of them have properties abroad. And they're always in the front to go and pay their property tax abroad as if that is a religion. But in Trinidad and Tobago, we, this, tax, this tax was waived for seven years. You have multimillionaires come telling you they need more time. Now is not the time. Well, it would never be the right time, but the time for you to get your condition improved in your neighborhood and put something in place to improve the quality of your life in your neighborhood, that time is now. <laughs> and we have the PNM. We are accustomed to standing alone. How many times have we stood in the breach alone? When we were to form the unit trust in this country, we stood alone. When we brought in PAYE in this country, we stood alone. When we brought free secondary education in this country, we stood alone. When we built the Mount Hope Hospital, we stood alone. 
When we created UTT, we stood alone. So don't be afraid. The PNM standing alone is par for the course in Trinidad and Tobago. So having built Point Lisas, when a manifesto of the others said that we had got involved in Sunset Industries and we should never have done that and we'll never do it again, today I'm talking to the United States government on a regular basis at all levels and I'm telling them that Trinidad and Tobago is an international participant at international level in methanol, urea, and ammonia, and LNG. That's us. PNM stood alone. PNM stood alone. So we are going to go ahead, now that the bill has gone to the Senate, we expect that it will pass in the Senate, and when it is passed in the Senate, then we will sit down and work out the structures that the law requires, and we'll do it in a systematic way to make sure that it has a chance of success and local government will move from just being local government election to being local government as a practice for the improvement in the quality of your life. And as for allegations of corruption in my government, seven years, seven years, they cannot point to a single minister who has a single difficulty about a single action that took place under my government. And just to make it very clear, Marlene's difficulty is for something that happened under the two governments before me, in the Manning administration, the UNC was there after me, and then I came in here leading this team. Nobody in this government is afraid of police or blue light, as I tell them before. And I tell my colleagues here, you could make mistakes. You could make mistakes. I, I expect you to make mistakes or not be as ready as you should be. I have your back. But on matters of honesty and integrity, if you fall short, you're on your own. <laughs> having said that, having said that, Forster should go because they don't like the fact that he has three pieces of land. They're shocked at the fact that he was in business handling a couple billion dollars. And of course, they are shocked that the Rowley family bought an apartment in Tobago for $1.2 million. I am now the subject of the Integrity Commission investigation. Maybe I should go too. But I could tell you, I could tell you one thing. When you are accustomed to thiefing, anybody you see with a bag, they figure they teach something. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of Arima, I'm always so happy to be here with you. And you have been a bulwark in this country, and you've been a patient people. Very soon, you will get to walk in and out of your brand new hospital the way it was designed. And you will continue in the PNM to provide leadership in this community. And we of the PNM will provide the leadership, making the changes for the better that this country deserves. And when we do that, we will shout, great is the PNM, great is the PNM, great is the PNM, and we shall prevail. Somebody